everybody. I'm Kelly Smith from Clemson University in South Carolina in the United States. I actually changed the title of my talk a little bit, Life is a Fuzzy Concept, and I found this picture. So there's life in there somewhere, but the boundaries around it are a bit fuzzy. Um, so I, I'm a philosopher. Uh, I'm your token philosopher, in fact. In this audience, standing up here and saying that makes me sound like I'm at a Philosopher's Anonymous meeting or something like that, because uh, there are too many of us out there. I, I'm, I should admit that I'm odd even for a philosopher, and, and the reason that is is because I was trained as an evolutionary biologist as well as a philosopher. So when I'm around philosophers, they tend to think of me as being too scientific, and when I'm around scientists, they think, tend to think of me as being too philosophical. I don't really quite fit in either one. But one of the reasons why I think it's important to say that here is that you know, I, I think it's important to realize that I, I fully understand the scientific method. I appreciate the scientific outlook. I choose to have a, a philosophical perspective a lot of times in these kinds of situations, partly to, to function as a foil to the sort of scientific outlook that people have. Perspectives matter, and, and there are different perspectives on a lot of these issues that can sometimes be interesting. Um, that doesn't mean that empirical issues are not also interesting um, and, and important. Uh, I, I've decided to dedicate the rest of my academic career to these kinds of social and ethical issues in astrobiology. So for better or for worse, I'm, I'm here to stay. And to make it even worse, at the end of my talk, I'll talk about how I'm trying to bring more people like me into the field. So I'm sorry if that ruins things for you, but there are probably more of us down the road. Um, so I like this slide from the very first day that Muriel had. We have all the different areas in, uh, in astrobiology, and I, I couldn't help noticing the, the basic problem that philosophers have in this. If you notice, philosophies down here at the bottom, there are lots and lots and lots of words, so many words they won't even fit into the bubble that's been assigned to us. This is the, the problem that philosophers have. If you have a data slide, it's relatively easy to give a 10, 15 minute talk about it. Philosophers don't tend to have data. We have ideas, and sometimes it's hard to articulate an idea clearly in a small amount of time. And to make it even a little bit more complicated, I actually submitted two abstracts for this, for this conference. One was about ethics and one was about life concepts. And I was accepted, but it wasn't clear which of the two abstracts was accepted. Then I looked in the abstracts and it was the life abstract that appeared in the abstracts, but it's in a session on social and ethical issues. So I wasn't quite sure exactly what I'm supposed to do. So I figured what I would do is I will first give you the controversial punchline from the ethical talk that I would have given. Hopefully that will annoy some of you and you can come up and talk to me afterwards at coffee breaks and things like that. And then I'll, I'll give most of what I would have said about the, the life talk as a more coherent sort of thing. I will just add though that if you're interested in this kind of stuff, most of my work is available on either ResearchGate or Academia and you can go look it up and, and get upset and email me and we can talk about these kinds of things. So here's the ethical punchline. Uh, it, it's often to the case in astrobiological situations that you're forced to make decisions about basically how how nice we should be to other kinds of life, right? That's ultimately a question about moral valuation, and there's an enormous literature on moral valuation that goes back several thousand years. Um, my basic conclusion about this is that all life is morally valuable, so life is more valuable than non-life. That is clearly true, but it's also clearly true, I would argue, that certain kinds of life are more valuable than others, and in particular, social, rational, cultural life is more valuable. I know that's controversial. I'm not putting that forward as the be all and end all position. On the other hand, I think it's a lot more defensible than most of you realize. So um, it, one application of this, I recently had a paper where I basically argued against Chris McKay and Carl Sagan and some other kinds of people that uh, once the technology is available and we've learned a bit about indigenous life forms on Mars, we would actually have an obligation to terraform Mars, a moral obligation to terraform Mars, even if that meant destruction of the indigenous species. And Believe it or not, I know, I know exactly some of the objections that are going through your minds right now, so I'll just say that that is perfectly consistent with animal rights and environmentalism properly conceived. So I'm not someone who thinks that we should pave over Mars to make for a convenient spaceship parking lot. On the other hand, uh, saying that we should respect life on Mars ultimately doesn't get you very far. Um, and there are some connections between my views about life and my views about morality, but I won't get into that right now. I don't have the time for it. So let's talk about life. 
Uh, the classic sort of historical approach to defining life is first you look at a whole bunch of examples of life and you try to figure out what the common characteristics that they all share are and then you write a list of 10 or 12 characteristics in the front, front page of your biology book, right? And rather than get into the details about what those characteristics are and the, the history of how they've been done, I want to step back a little bit, which is something philosophers often do, and ask, why do we approach the problem in this way in the first place? Why do we think that kind of approach is the right way of answering the question of what life is? And I think the bottom line is it's because we tend to assume, as scientists and as philosophers as well, that our job is to delineate natural kinds. Now, I know many of you are thinking, I never thought that was my job. I don't even know what a natural kind is. But my argument is that this, this is a technical philosophical term, but it applies to the way I think scientists go about ca categorization in, in general and in particular when it comes to life. So the way it's traditionally put is when you're trying to define a natural kind, you're trying to carve nature at its joints. That's the classical uh, way of putting it. But the idea basically is that when you come up with concepts and categories in science, you want them to be isomorphic to reality. You want them to exist in the real world as well as in your scientific theory. Or one way of putting it is, a correctly described scientific category is one that's going to exist whether there are scientists who talk about it or not. As opposed to just something that makes us feel good or that's psychologically advantageous. Right? We, we want to try to get things right. Right? And this goes way back at least as far as Aristotle. Um, so Aristotle argues basically that the world is just a set of categories and they're hierarchically arranged. And so you want to try to figure out the correct way in which everything fits together. And the bottom line is, is that when you go down the hierarchy, what you're trying to do is find shared characteristics that are shared by all and only members of the lower level taxa and not by all the members of the upper level taxa. And then that's true all the way down the line. Classic example of this would be genus and species in biology, which is actually from Aristotle. So, you know, what a species is, is a set within a genus that all shares some particular attribute. You could call it an apomorphy, you could call it a differentiate, it doesn't really matter. Um, chemical elements are the, also a classic example that philosophers spent a lot of time talking about. So, you know, typically when we think about the shared properties that makes a, a category unique, we think in terms of structural or material components, which works great in physics and pretty good in chemistry and not very well at all in biology. So, you know, gold by definition is matter with 79 protons, right? Uh, and the fact that when we can do the, the the, el the table of elements and we can cleanly divide up matter that way and we're very confident that there's not a whole lot of intermediate stuff that we need to worry about, that gives us increased confidence that we've gotten it right, that it's not just something we made up that fulfills some purpose that only humans care about. It, it seems to be objective in a way that we care about. All right. Biology, though, is fundamentally different. So life is messy. It doesn't really display any clean boundaries. Anybody who's ever gone into the field with a field manual to try to identify things is very familiar with this problem because nothing ever looks like the picture in the manual, and you're always sitting there looking at the manual saying, well, that bird looks a little bit like this bird, but not exactly. And it looks a little bit like that bird, but not exactly. And so you, you, it's very difficult. Sometimes you actually require a world expert to come in and identify what bird you're talking about. The main reason for that is that biological processes are different. So biological processes, biological categories, are created by evolutionary processes, right? And evolution is a stochastic process that in fact requires variation. So if you don't have variation among individuals, you cannot have evolution and therefore you cannot create new biological categories. So it seems a bit odd that we would expect biology driven by this kind of stochastic force to produce clean divisions between concepts. That's really not the way it should be. And so to foreshadow what I'm going to say in a minute, what that ultimately means is that life really can't be a black and white phenomenon. It can't be a yes, no kind of thing. Life has to come in degrees. That's one takeaway from this kind of thing. Um, so as a consequence, when people realize that their view of natural kinds doesn't really mesh well with biology, there are a couple of different kinds of things you can do. One set of common maneuvers is to argue that the way you've categorized things is somehow wrong. And so when it comes to life definitions, there's uh, Carol Cleland, a philosopher at University of Colorado, who's put, put out a whole bunch of papers about how we shouldn't bother trying to define life at all. That essentially uh, the fact that we can't come up with clean categories that res resist counterexamples means that we don't really understand what life is. It's a bit like, according to Cleland, uh, alchemists trying to talk about 
materials. They don't have a theory of matter that really works, and therefore any attempt they make to try to classify materials is just completely wrong-headed. And if we just wait until we truly understand life, it'll all fall into place. That is deeply misguided. And so if you're at all um, attracted to that way of thinking about it, let me know and I'll give you a paper that will provide the antidote to that. Um, the, the other side of the coin is to sort of think that all definitions are equally acceptable. So since we can't come up with clean definitions, let's just make a giant list of all the definitions of life that anybody's ever talked about and maybe have a little bit of a taxonomy of that and then we'll sort of say, well, they're all okay in some sense and just it, it, do away with the process of defining in a different kind of way, right? Both of those really, the problem basically is essentially the same sort of problem that this old joke is. So people have heard this joke before. I doubt this is actually true, but anyway. The idea is if you want to catch a monkey, you put a banana in a jar, and the monkey will reach in the jar, and he'll grab the banana, and then he won't be able to get his hand out of the jar, and, and you've caught yourself a monkey, right? Whereas if you were an advisor to this monkey, you would want to tell him, well, if you just let go of the banana, your hand will come back out of the jar, everything's cool. The banana in this case is our traditional concept of natural kinds. Right? That's what's causing the problem. It, there's nothing wrong with biology. There's nothing wrong with our concepts of life in a very general sense. The problem is that we've insisted on this way of thinking about scientific categories that come in clean divisions with necessary and sufficient conditions at each step. That doesn't apply to biology. Now, I think you could have an argument about whether or not it applies to physics and chemistry, but I'm not going to go there right now. So, in other words, we really need to stop thinking about biological categories as having clean boundaries of any kind. On the other hand, we need to have some conception that we're talking about kinds. We don't want science to give up the claim that what it's doing is objective. We don't want science to sort of admit that, yes, all we're really doing is telling stories that make human beings happy, and there's no reason to think, for example, that alien scientists would come up with anything like the same kinds of categories. So you need some sort of claim to objectivity, right? And I think the, the, the bottom line is what you really need to start doing, particularly in biology, is to start thinking about categories, scientific categories, as being fuzzy, right? So one way of putting it is that all differences between biological categories are differences in degree, not differences in kind. Differences in kind, that's where that term comes from. They're really differences in degree, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't some important discontinuities that are really critical to identify that change the dynamics of the systems that you're studying, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to, you have to balance between this sort of universal smear of concepts and being able to actually say something interesting about one thing that doesn't apply to another thing. So, there are two general approaches. I mean, if you leave aside the more crude kinds of operational approaches, there are two very general approaches to the way we should think about life. Uh, there, are, there are really more approaches than there are definitions because there are many variations on these themes. But there's the metabolism sort of approach. Metabolism approaches tend to sort of take a thermodynamic perspective. So the idea is basically that to be alive, you have to have a metabolism that utilizes energy from your environment and allows you to maintain some characteristic state or self or individuality or, or whatever. That's the basic idea behind metabolism. It tends to be very popular with origins of life researchers because it allows them to talk about chemical autocatalytic systems and it allows them to take the kinds of stuff they study in the lab and talk about them in a very detailed way as, as offering a definition of life, right? So it is, on the one hand, there's something obviously correct about this. Nothing is going to be alive if it cannot metabolize, right? It needs to have an energy source. There's, there, is, there are thermodynamic constraints that cannot be ignored. So that's clearly true. The problem is that at least for basic metabolic definitions, they cast the net too widely. There are many things that are included as potential living things that for good reasons, we don't really want to be in there. So fire, crystals, et cetera, et cetera. Now there are all kinds of variations on this theme, but I, I won't get into that kind of stuff right now. So uh, while I think it's true to say that metabolism is a necessary condition for life, it's nowhere close to being sufficient. It, it's too loose, it's a little bit too loose. On the other end of the scale, there's a sort of evolutionary perspective, which I must admit, I was drawn to very strongly for a very long time. I'm an evolutionary biologist, so I too am not immune to the, this is what I do, so I like this kind of approach. So the evolutionary accounts basically say that it's, it's really the ability to undergo evolution by natural selection that's the hallmark of life, and that once you get that, then you have a living system. And, and again, I think there's something 
really correct about that uh, if we're all naturalists, and, and maybe uh, we'll have a conversation later about whether or not this is appropriate attitude, but assuming that we're naturalists, it's very difficult to imagine a system becoming sufficiently complex that it would count as alive without participating in evolution by natural selection. So that seems to be correct. Uh, on the other hand, there are lots and lots of things that we consider to be alive, again, for good reasons, which don't themselves undergo evolution. So, so yeah, thank you. So, so strictly speaking, only populations evolve. Sometimes people point to infertile individuals, but that's the tip of the iceberg, right? Only populations evolve, so nobody in this room is alive, according to an evolutionary definition, strictly applied. And one thing philosophers will do is we will force you to be consistent. So if you want to say that you, in order to be alive, you have to participate in an evolutionary process, we will hold your feet to that logical fire, right? Um, so evolution is probably also a necessary condition, but it's a necessary condition for the origin of life. It's not a necessary, necessary condition for being alive. And how you get to be alive and what it means to be alive are not the same thing. This is a confusion that, that I had among other people for many, many, many years. So let's do a quick thought experiment. Let's suppose an alien lands on Earth, he goes on a talk show circuit, uh, he, he makes lots of friends, he seems to be a witty, nice, intelligent guy, he's got amazingly high technology, and I ask you, is this alien alive? Now, I would argue that if all those conditions are actually met, we have every reason in the world to consider that alien to be alive. However, we don't necessarily know anything about that alien's evolutionary history, and while it's a good bet, in fact, it, it seems necessary, that the alien has a metabolism, it's not on the basis of having a metabolism that we make that judgment. What is the basis for that judgment? The basis for that judgment is that this alien obviously exhibits complex adap adaptive traits. That's what makes life what it is. And this is a very old concept, right? The teleology or something like that. Now, I know that the T word has a lot of historical baggage, but it, it, you can phrase it in a way that doesn't involve those kinds of problems. But what it is to be alive essentially is the way, the way an organism behaves. So, uh, very old wine, new bottles. This is the way I think about life. It's about behaviors, right? Life, my definition of life at this point is any process capable of producing open-ended adaptive variation. That's what it means to be alive. It doesn't really matter that much what the time scale is. It doesn't really matter that much the mechanism by which it is allowed to do that. Those are secondary considerations. They're fascinating questions, and I think it's great that scientists want to investigate those, but they're not the same thing as talking about what life is. And moreover, what that means is life is going to come in degrees. There, there's not going to be a clean boundary, partly because adaptive capacity can vary. It can vary between individuals. It can vary within an individual or population over time. It can vary based on environmental considerations, and of course, open-ended is a relative term, so we can get in this debate about how open-ended does something need to be, so my take on this would be it's probably better to have some relatively clean division between living things and non-living things, and then a smear of more and less alive kinds of things under certain sort of circumstances, so viruses might be alive, but not very alive, or something like that. And I'm going to end by just saying very quickly something about this. Uh, uh, as I told you, I'm going to try to recruit more people like me. I, I think that astrobiology raises a number of these social, ethical, conceptual questions that experts outside of the hard sciences would actually be able to contribute to. But we need expertise. And right now, most of my colleagues in philosophy and history and things like that think uh, astrobiology is science fiction. They, they don't realize what we're doing, and they, they really are completely unaware of this. So myself and a few colleagues, what we're trying to do right now is form a new organization, a new academic organization, which is open to anybody from any discipline as long as they're interested in rigorous exploration of these kinds of broader questions. We had a meeting in Clemson in September. We're going to have another meeting in uh, Reno, Nevada in spring of 2018. So if you're interested or you know anybody who's interested, please email me and I will put you on a, an email list and you will get information later on when it develops. And of course, you can always email me and just yell at me about various kinds of things. That's always your option. Okay, thank you. <laughs>